Hi guys, welcome to uh, Brain Part 2. We're going to start with um, the brain's associated structures, like for example, well I think we know that the brain is in the cranial cavity in your skull here, but um, you see how the brain sits on top of the cranial base? So there are these depressions in the skull called the cranial fossa, and it's what the brain sits in, in the brain case. cranial base has the cranial fossa fossa is singular e pluralizes it um, there are three of them these three depressions in the brain they're color coded there amp there's the the a is for anterior cranial fossa that supports the frontal lobe. The M, middle cranial fossa, supports the temporal lobe. P, posterior cranial fossa, supports the cerebellum. So now you know how the brain sits in the cranial base in those fossa. Um, other things that help keep the brain in the brain case, the dural septa. So on that little inset up here, that's brain in, remove the brain, you have the empty cranial cavity. And we can see these connective tissue barriers, uh, the dural septa, you know, the dura mater. They create septa or little partitions. Um, that separate parts of the brain in the skull. And there's only two I want you to know, the falx and the tentorium. The falx cerebri, right here, this is a sagittal plane there, divides this plane right there. The falx cerebri divides the left and right cerebral hemispheres. Oh, shoot. Hold on, I need to get something to erase with. So the dural septa, the falx, the full name is falx cerebri. Remembering the full name tells you what it divides, left and right cerebral hemispheres.
The other one is the the tentorium cerebelli. Um, it runs along posterior uh, part of the skull here. Anyways, it's kind of in the horizontal plane there. It's going to divide the cerebrum above from cerebellum below. Tentorium cerebelli. Divides cerebrum from cerebellum. Moving on to next thing, to the next thing uh, associated with the brain, the the CSF. So so far we've talked about um, how the brain sits in the cranial base. We've talked about uh, connective tissue dural septa that separate parts of the brain. Now we're going to talk about the CSF that bathes and protects the brain. The CSF is the filtration of uh, blood plasma, has all the essential nutrients blood is um, that you need from the blood. Whole blood is toxic to neural tissue, so we want to filter out the plasma and just get the essential parts of the blood plasma, which is the cerebral spinal fluid, CSF. And I want you to know how it circulates around the brain here. And um, the ventricles of the brain cushion the brain from the inside. They're filled with CSF. They're shown, um, well, this is what we studied the last time. But if you remove brainstem diencephalon right here, and you can see the cerebellum there and brainstem, you can see how the ventricles of the brain associate with the brainstem. Here are the ventricles all by themselves. Here they are kind of transparent, you can see them in the brain, in the whole entire brain, brainstem apparatus there. So the next slide just shows you the different parts um, of the ventricles, or the different ventricles. There, there, there's four, okay? And you need to know what they are. So these are filled and just help circulate the CSF. For example, you have ventricles of the heart filled with blood. These are ventricles of the brain filled with CSF. Two of them are these ram-shaped horns. So just call them number one, two lateral ventricles. The number two is pointing to the third ventricle. Number three is pointing to a small channel called the cerebral aqueduct. Number four is the fourth ventricle. As you can see, number three, uh, structure number three, the cerebral aqueduct connects the third and the fourth ventricle. The fourth ventricle is continuous with number five. The central canal goes all the way down the center of the spinal cord. Here's a picture. There's the ventricles of the brain, but here's um, the central nervous system. Um, medulla, pons, I'm oh, sorry, midbrain, got that wrong. Midbrain, pons, medulla. Cerebellum, and the space in between, fourth ventricle. So I want you to know that the fourth ventricle is located between pons, cerebellum.
It says pawns. Cerebellum. Third ventricle is loaded, located between the two thalamus. Thalami, if that's the pluralized part of the world. world. So there's a diencephalon. Um, there's two of them, and they're on either side of the third ventricle. There's a little hole in there that accommodates the intermediate mass of the thalamus that connects the two thalamus. There's a hole in the third ventricle. accommodates the intermediate mass of the thalamus. Long term, I barely Got it on the board. Just wanted to give you the full label picture that I showed you earlier. Here are some questions for you. Three cranial fossa, anterior, middle, posterior. The anterior supports um, frontal lobes, middle supports temporal lobes, posterior supports cerebellum, the two dural septa, the falx, and the tentorium. The falx cerebri uh, separates left and right cerebral hemispheres. Tentorium cerebelli separates cerebrum above from cerebellum below. The four ventricles of the brain. Two lateral ventricles, third ventricle, fourth ventricle. That's the four. The location of the third ventricle is between the thalamus, the fourth ventricle located between pons, cerebellum, the structure connecting third and fourth ventricles, cerebral aqueduct. How is CSF generated? That's the next topic by the choroid plexus. Plexus, choroid, that's basically a comp means complex network of blood vessels. That's what it's become known to me as. Um, all right. So these. This complex network of blood vessels located in two places associated with third and fourth ventricles. Two are located by third and fourth ventricles. These choroid plexus, they generate the CSF. They basically filter blood plasma by filtering blood plasma. So we call that the blood CSF barrier. You got is this thing here, this thing here, just a close up view of how it's working. These capillaries, which allow for exchange of metabolites, um, we kind of tighten the filtration that is being filtered out here. Capillaries are always supposed to allow exchange of um, goods. They're leaky blood vessels designed to be leaky, so we have gas exchange, metabolite exchange, but in the brain, we want to limit that uh, exchange by putting these cells around it that have 
tight junctions. They're ependymal cells. They're one of the glial cells we uh, talked about earlier. So these ependymal cells are these gray cells surrounding the blood vessel. Ependymal cells surround blood vessels. Remember, these are the blood vessels of the choroid plexus. The key is the ependymal cells have tight junctions. That's the key. Ependymal cells surround. And that's the key that makes it a, a barrier between blood and CSF. But the ependymal cells have tight junctions. And this essentially forms what we call the blood CSF barrier. Forming a blood CSF barrier. No mistake, they're, they're making the CSF. This is a barrier between blood. So you filter the blood, and what you get? CSF. So it is the blood CSF barrier, and it's making the CSF by filtering blood through these tight junctions. Not much gets through. Just things that, essential things the neural tissue needs, namely, glucose, oxygen. There are other small molecules in there. It's a clear fluid that circulates around. Um, I'll just note that the CSF has the glucose and the oxygen. Let's see here. Clear the board here. So the ependymal cells with tight junctions filter blood plasma. That's the liquid part of blood generating the CSF. all the nutrients you need, good old O2 and glucose for metabolism. So that's what's special about these. You got the tight junctions. These ependymal cells up here, they're ependymal cells too, no tight junctions. You don't have that um, generation of the CSF there. You know, because you only have the choroid plexus in those two locations, everywhere else you still need to protect um, neural tissue from whole blood. So everywhere else you have what's called the, the blood-brain barrier uh, shown here. It's actually a side-by-side. -side. This is the blood-brain barrier. This is regular capillaries. Okay, There's a capillary in here with the blood-brain barrier. Regular capillary anywhere else. So the key for regular capillaries is to have little gaps between cells. The cells of the capillaries are endothelial cells. The endothelial cells are wrapped with a basement membrane. Let's see if I can draw that out. The endothelial cells that I just drew are the cells of the cell wall of capillary blood vessels.
The blood is inside there. There's an RBC, a red blood cell, inside the blood vessel, the capillary. Anyways, all um, epithelial tissues, like endothelial cells, have a basement membrane. The basement membrane is connective tissue matrix, and all connective tissue matrices, they need to be maintained by cells too, and I believe that's what the pericytes are for. So I'll draw another cell here. I'll just say basement membrane with pericytes. They just kind of maintain that basement membrane. And that's a regular capillary. And the regular capillary has this small gap for free exchange. Okay? And that's the key there. And the difference is in the brain, we want to protect neural tissue from whole blood. So um, one thing is we put tight junctions between the gaps. I'll say between ECs, endothelial cells. Tight junctions between endothelial cells, ECs. That, that limits the exchange, it limits the filtration uh, of the whole blood. You're protecting the nervous uh, tissue from the whole blood with these tight junctions. Um, in addition to that, you have these astrocytes with have, which have these, um, I call them paravascular feet, that further surround the capillary basement membrane, um, further enhancing what we call this blood-brain barrier, limiting the cap capillary exchange. So let me see if I can draw that. I'll, I'll use green for the astrocyte. Astrocytes with perivascular feet. So here's the nucleus, the cell. I'm just going to draw these extensions that go around. Okay, I think you get the idea. So these are the paravascular feet. They further wrap around. And really, it's the tight junctions with the paravascular feet that is this blood-brain barrier where you're limiting, um, limiting the capillary exchange. So blood-brain barrier. Basic goal, protect brain from whole blood. Limit the... Uh, Exchange, paravascular feet, tight junctions. Check, check, check that. That's the blood brain barrier, those two things. Okay, so that's um, all the barriers, and CSF circulates all around the brain. You got those two barriers, and uh, but it does freely circulate, nourishing um, the entire central nervous system, brain and brain stem. And here are our two choroid plexuses. The CSF is generated at the choroid plexuses. Right here, third and fourth ventricles. CSF, it circulates in a space called the subarachnoid space, just deep to the uh, arachnoid mater.
Sorry, I had to turn my son's TV down. All right, so um, CSF, it circulates in the arachnoid, subarachnoid space. Generated here, these little black arrows are showing you it's circulating all around this light blue area. That's the subarachnoid space, the light blue area. Well, think of CSF being generated as fluid input. You have to have a fluid output. The CSF is returned to venous blood at the arachnoid granulations into the dural sin uh, sinuses. So I kind of blew it up right here where you see the arachnoid granulations. Right here, you can see CSF circulate. There's enough positive pressure to push it up and out. This dark blue is venous blood in the dural sinus. The dural sinus is a vein of the brain, essentially. It'll drain back to the jugular vein. So, anyways, um, I'm writing CSF generated at coral plexus. I said that's kind of like the fluid input. So think of this arachnoid granulation, fluid output, where the CSF flows back to blood, whole blood. granulation, fluid output, CSF returns to venous blood. The name of this structure that is a dural sinus, it's actually called the superior sagittal sinus. It's right here in the, in the middle of your uh, two cerebral hemispheres. Superior sagittal sinus. There are other dural sinuses of the brain. They all drain out of the brain into the neck through the internal jugular vein. I'll just say superior sagittal sinus. All dural sinuses lead to internal jugular vein. So I blew this up just to be clear that we're all, um, just to be sure we're all clear on the different membranes in different compartments here. Right? I've labeled one through six. I want to make sure you know them all. Number one, that's the space where CSF circulates. That is subarachnoid space. Number two is the arachnoid mater, one of those three meningeal layers, dura mater, arachnoid mater, pia mater. So number two, the pink arachnoid mater. Number three and four, you have a double layered uh, dura mater. Usually it's a single layer, but where you have the sinuses, it's a double layer. One is associated, what's called a meningeal part, because it's just, it's just a membrane part that's associated with the other uh, membranes. And the one, this is actually stuck to the inside of the skull. 
It's the dura mater. They call it the periosteal part. So, three and four both dura mater. Okay. Uh, just think of three as the. Uh, let me do it this way. Sorry. Three meningeal part four, periosteal part of dura mater. Number five is the arachnoid granulation. That's where the CSF gets filtered out back into the blood. Think of it as a little extension of the arachnoid mater that kind of pokes up into the blood. Six, that's the um, that's venous blood, the superior sagittal sinus. Venous blood in superior sagittal sinus. So here's a picture of what we just looked at, superior sagittal sinus. Here's a posterior view of the skull. You can see superior sagittal sinus inside the skull between the um, hemispheres of the brain, right in the sagittal plane. And all these other sinuses, they'll all drain all the venous blood down to the neck. The, the IJV, the internal jugular vein, exits the skull and it's the main vein in the neck returning all the blood um, from the brain to the heart. So I just wanted to give you one picture of internal jugular vein. All right, questions for you. The blood CSF barrier, number one, the key thing there is the ependymal cells with the tight junction. That is the barrier that generates the CSF. Number two, the blood-brain barrier. I mentioned two things. The endothelial cells have the tight junctions, and the astrocytes with the paravascular feet limit the capillary filtration. The CSF circulation, well, it starts with the subarachnoid space. It flows up through the arachnoid granulations, then you're in the venous blood, superior sagittal sinus, all the uh, dural sinuses drain to IJV. Basal ganglia. So we focused a lot on the cerebrum in brain part one. Um, that's gray matter. The inner white matter, there's all these different nuclei. We'll, we'll focus on just one set. Um, not getting a chance to teach everything, but we'll focus on the basal ganglia. The basal ganglia, execute constant comparison of motor and sensory inputs. The basal ganglia allow you to adjust muscle tone during voluntary movements. Things like me writing. Things like me, um, for example,
reaching out, I'm grabbing my coffee mug, taking a drink. Things we take for granted. People with akinesias have a problem with um, some kind of neurotransmitter function. They, 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 can't, they can't write. It's, they have um, involuntary movements. Well, let's learn how this normally works by first looking at the basal ganglia. We cut the brain open. This picture is color-coded. This is a, um, a frontal plane view right here. Just to orient you, those are those lateral ventricles we talked about. Um, here's third ventricle. Okay, You have caudate, putamen, glowus pallidus. Those three, those three are what are called the basal ganglia uh, or the basal nuclei, which is another name for it. Basal ganglia nuclei. Both these terms simply mean a cluster of cell bodies. So these are very important for executing movement. Caudate, putamen, globus pallidus. Those are the three nuclei of the basal nuclei or the basal ganglia. Okay, so know that. We're going to focus on putamen in one loop called the motor loop. So to execute movements, there are, there are many loops you could talk about. I want to focus on one involving these new, uh, basal ganglia called the motor loop. And I'll use this kind of diagram to show you how it is a loop. So I'll, everything here is inside the brain, but I'll just kind of like concept map it out so you can kind of see what I'm talking about. So this motor loop will kind of show you how the basal ganglia help us execute regular movements. So they help us execute regular motor movements. They have to receive inputs that the cerebrum is receiving. Um, so for example, the putamen receives inputs that are both motor and sensory. Receives both motor and sensory inputs. So the putamen is kind of like the processing center. It's receiving this information and um, quote unquote, it decides whether or not to execute this movement and then it streams lines, and then it stream uh, lines a plan to do so. It decides. execute a movement comes up with a plan to do so develops plan to do so So for example, if, uh, if I'm trying to execute the movement of grabbing my coffee cup, but I, uh, but I feel like I overreach, or if I grab it and it starts to fall, I make adjustments. So that's kind of what it's doing. It's processing the information by you feeling grabbing something if you're doing it correctly.
And that plan of execution involves coming up with two pathways. There's a direct pathway that facilitates the goal-oriented movement, um, the goal of, say, picking up my coffee cup, or an indirect pathway that suppresses all other competing movements. Anything that would make me drop my coffee mug would be suppressed. So that's the plan, direct, indirect. Stimulate that, inhibit that. Okay? So that, that's when I say develop develops plan before I erase this. That's the plan, these two pathways. pathways. The direct pathway, that's the goal. It, it, it facilitates the goal for the movement you're trying to execute. Okay? A goal oriented movement. Indirect. You're suppressing all other competing movements that will interfere with your goal, okay? Picking up my coffee cup. Any movement that allows me to drop it is a competing movement I want to suppress. Suppress all other competing movements. And it's sending those pathway informations to the thalamus. The thalamus. Remember, that's your sensory switchboard. So the signal that reaches the thalamus, what's well, a balance of these pathways? Okay. And the goal is to execute the goal-oriented movement. Reaching thalamus is a balance of both pathways direct and indirect. Then the thalamus will take that um, info received and loop it back to the motor cortex so you can actually move correctly. That's the next step. Feeds back to the motor cortex. And then the motor cortex will then execute the movement by sending the signal down the spinal cord and the correct nerve, the correct muscle. Sends correct motor command. Execute movement that appears sleek and effortless, like a dancer executing a rehearsed routine. Sleek. So, we're executing constant comparison between motor and sensory inputs. That's the key. You have motor and sensory inputs being processed by centers in your brain to make sure you're not moving incorrectly. This allows you to make muscle tone adjustments during voluntary movements. Like, you know, I'll give you another example. Like, if you kind of trip 
and almost fall and you catch yourself. Um, that's kind of like the basal ganglia helping you out. There, there are diseases where if you have a problem with this motor loop called akinesias, there's a link to a YouTube video if you want to watch it. Well, we won't watch this one together, we'll watch other ones together. If you want to get an idea of what goes wrong with this motor loop, here's some questions you can answer about that. Questions for you. Number one, which type of inputs does the putamen receive? Both, sensory and motor. What does the putamen do with this information? It's the processing center. It comes up with a, a plan to execute the movement by creating two pathways, direct and indirect. The direct pathway is the goal of the movement, the goal-oriented movement. Indirect pathway, you're suppressing other competing movements that get in the way of you executing your goal-oriented movement. Where is the output of putamen sent to? Thalamus. So thalamus, where does it send its feedback to? Motor cortex. The end result, still up here. The execute movement, that seems sleek and effortless. It, it's, it's been rehearsed, okay? So like when you rehearse and you're learning a dance routine, everything's kind of awkward and you're developing your motor loop so that when it's well rehearsed, it looks effortless. I developed um, the notes for the motor loop from this uh, YouTube from Dr. Claudia Krebs. Um, I used to use other textbooks that are a little more fancy. I like the way she explains it. That's why I used it for the base of this lecture. If you want to watch this YouTube clip, it's really good. The motor loop is described first, so you get to see what I taught first. And she describes other loops, but you're not responsible for those other ones, just the motor loop, the first one in this clip. Watch it if you want. The next topic is language aphages. This is another basic brain topic of a basic anatomy class that we like to teach students because in humans, language is it. Language is what separates us um, from all the other animals in the other animal kingdoms, and um, language acquisition is very important. So we can understand the importance of language by studying language aphasias. First noted by Dr. Carl Wernicke and Broca, we still call them Wernicke's area, Broca's area of the brain. Let's remember that Broca's area is the area for motor speech. Wernicke's area is for language comprehension. If you have a stroke or something that affects either of those areas, maybe a tumor, anything that disrupts the function of these areas, it creates language aphasias because these are the um, areas responsible for motor speech and language comprehension. So remember, motor speech is the act of like me talking out loud and everything, all the muscles, my tongue, my lips that have to move to, to form words and to spit the words out, although sometimes I can't get them out very clearly. Usually I do. Um, that's motor speech. Language comprehension is just understanding the words. Like, for example, um, this is the example of reading out loud. Well, you have to see the words in your visual cortex. I understand English. If I understand it, that's language comprehension. That's Wernicke's area line, lining up. If I want to read the words out loud, 
Like for example, I'll read number three. Information from Warnicke's area is transferred to Broca's area. So just for me to read that, the information, I had to see the word, I had to understand the word, Broca's area had to, had to then communicate with my primary motor cortex to get the words out. Okay, So reading silently and understanding, that's language comprehension. But then reading out loud, you're also using Broca's area, which then sends the information to the primary motor cortex. So if you have a language aphasia, a problem in these areas, um, it creates two problems. Broca's aphasia, Wernicke's aphasia. Broca's aphasia, the person, it's very frustrating for the person. They, they kind of know what they want to say, but they can't get the words out. So you'll see very difficult, effortful speech. It's difficult to get the words out. Effortful speech, uh, hard to get the words out. You know, you know what you want to say, you just can't quite say it, okay? Wernicke's aphasia is described as a fluent aphasia. A fluent aphasia in that um, fluent means, well, you can, you can speak clearly. You're just not making any sense. It's like all the words are mixed up and scrambled. And when you try to communicate with someone with Wernicke's aphasia, they, they call it a word salad. Just all the words are mixed up. You, it's just nonsensical, but it's fluent. A word salad. So I want to make um, this lecture a, a little more case study driven. So I have some video clips that we can watch of each of these aphasias. Um, here are the links. I'll be sure to post uh, the PowerPoint version so that the links are active. Um, but we can just watch them here. We're going to start with an example of Wernicke's um, aphasia of uh, Byron. So you can Watch the link on your own device, or you can just watch it here. It's up to you. Hi, Byron. How are you? I'm happy. Are you pretty? You look good. What are you doing today? We stayed with the water over here at the moment and talked with the people up with them over there. They're diving for them at the moment. With the statement at the moment, he'll have water for soon for him. With luck for him. So we're on a cruise and we're about to We get will to sort it right here and they'll save their hands right there for and, them. And what were we just doing with the iPad? Uh, right at the moment, they don't show a darn thing. <laughs> <laughs> the iPad that we were doing. We, like here? I've got my change for me and change hands for me. It was happy. I would talk with Donna sometimes. We're out with them. Other people are working with them with them. I'm very happy with them. Good. This girl was fairly good and happy. And I played golf and hit other trees. We play out with the hands. We save a lot of hands on hold for people, for us, other hands. I don't know what you get, but I talk with a lot of hands for him. Sometimes when I talk of any more to say in. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And I hope the world lasts for you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Bye bye. Have a good day. Okay, so that was Byron. Um, so you could see I, he spoke clearly. 
but he couldn't respond to the interviewer's questions. He just wasn't making sense. And the question that's always asked to me is, well, does he know what he's saying? Does he, does he understand that he's communicating nonsensically? And I don't know. I can't get in his head. But that's how it presents. Just you can speak clearly, you can communicate, but you're not communicating anything that's in context. I think he was on a cruise, but he couldn't respond. But he could talk, just not communicating. That's a language aphasia called you know, Wernicke's aphasia. So this is an example of Broca's aphasia. You understand what you want to say, you just can't get the words out. Effortful, difficult, effortful speech. So you start to drop non-essential words like the and or pronouns, things like that. And I like to use Sarah Scott, who's a stroke survivor, as an example, an example of a, a young girl. Um, she's like 19 when she had her stroke. And uh, most of you are 19-year-old college students or a little older. And I want you to see that, you know, this can affect young people too. And I, I think her uh, case is very encouraging too. Um, so one year, three years, six years is post-stroke. One year after her stroke, you can kind of see how she is and how she progresses through the years. It's a good case study that tracks your progress. So again, you got the links. Watch on your own device or just watch it right here. Okay. <coughs> so what's your name? That's right. And how old are you? I can't. Try. I can't. You're 19. 19. Yeah. Yeah. And what happened to you? Um, stroke. You had a stroke last year? Yes. And what happened? Can you remember what happened? Um, 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 school and English class. Okay. And I, um, book and I read it aloud. Um, but I can't because stroke. And so I send the, and, um, also, um, it's um the same as um the same of kind of thing as um you, you know pins and needles yeah like pins the and same needles. and also <coughs> armors but leg egg uh, uh, leg yeah yeah and what happened after the stroke with your speech well I I can't. You have speech problems. Yeah. Do you know what that's called? Uh, yeah. Aphasia. <laughs> fa yeah, good, good. I haven't heard you say the word before. <laughs> I write it down. <clears throat> and that helps? Yeah. Okay. So you are going to go to university. What are you doing now? What? What do you do now? Every day. Oh, um, speech, um, um, the speech therapy. Yeah. Okay. And um, <coughs> also riding. Um, riding what? Oh. Um, horses. Yeah. Good. And. <coughs> and. And connect. Connect, yeah. You like connect, don't you? Um, and it, yeah. Why do you like connect? Um, aphasia, so I can... The same kind of problems and, and speech. Like, yeah. Okay. And how do you feel? I'm fine. <laughs> You're fine. That's good. Um.
Well, you can watch the whole clip on your own, but I think uh, you, you got a sense of the broca's aphasia. Um, happened in a young person. You could kind of see she would kind of just drop out unnecessary words like mom asked. I think it's her mom. Well, what happened? And she just said, stroke. Okay, well, what happened that day? And she just said things like school. And she just said essential words. Um, also notice um, it helps her to write things down. And what's happening there? If she writes it down, she can see it. Wernicke's area is going on and it helps the Broca's area, which is damaged, but it seems to help her get the words out. She knows what she wants to say, but she has to write it down to help her say it. Okay. The question becomes, can you get better? Well, let's watch three years. And this month we've been quite busy because we've been working to raise awareness of stroke for Stroke Awareness Month. And um, what have we been doing? So, um, it's a magazine. Um, it's a prima, um, but it's not out yet. Um, and it's to do with my stroke and also my mum's stroke as well. Um, so that's um, good because I want more, uh, like more awareness. Uh, yeah, um, awareness to do with my stroke because I'm younger, <clears throat> and just because just stroke and also. Uh, aphasia because it's still not out there yet really and I want to say it's a word and it's and what does it mean what does it mean to you aphasia um well it's to do with it's not to do with just like speech it's to do with writing speaking reading like all of that um, because it's um, because the brain in your um, that part of the brain is affected and so it's what I think what I know because I I had a stroke and so it's not exactly not um, but anyway, I think it's the, the, if you had a stroke, it's the one that you don't want to have. Because I think if you can't speak or write it down or whatever, I think that's, it's um, the cruelest way. And um, yeah. So it's hard to talk to your family and friends and yeah do simple things like talk on the phone or use Facebook text and all that kind of thing is really tough for you. Yeah. I know if you you can't um if you can't um walk then yes that's terrible and I, I think it's terrible anyway. But if you can't talk or whatever that's I think it's really horrible. And people say to you, well, your speech is so good now, but they don't realise that you still have problems every day. Yeah, and it's also the, the money that's the problem, because that's really hard. Understanding coins yeah. and money. Because if it did, if I'm just um, walking around, I, I want like a, I don't know, I want to buy something, it's harder. <clears throat> 
or I want to like the pub or I can't buy anything. Also, I'm very, not scared, but I'm nervous. And so I just, I can't, it's no. too hard. And people, people don't understand, do they? No. no. Lots of time. It's hard. And you still can't, can't read a sentence very well, can you? Yeah. And writing, you can write single words still, but sentences are still hard. So although you look fine, you still have a dis well yeah, yeah. You, do. you still have a disability because we also did some television the other week didn't we we did a breakfast show Lorraine and yes that was good you did really well on that yes but sometimes like today I think my speech is it's not good also I've already um drink one you um, had some cider today yeah. to celebrate yes. <laughs> that's good well not. Yes, it's good, but um, if I do that, sometimes my speech is not good. And sometimes, if I'm um, sleepy or nervous or whatever, sometimes I can't say, like, can't speak at all. Really or really slowly or, or, you know, but I can... Mm -hmm. It really affects you. So it's not... My speech is, it's not there yet, mm -hmm. and, yeah. But you are happy and you're doing well and yeah, not too bad really. Improving a lot since the last video, I think. It's good. Um, and I think because um, it's already finished now, but it's <coughs> a speech therapy in London. <coughs> You were doing a research programme and it's something called transcranial magnetic therapy where you have an electrical current put through your brain while you're having speech therapy and that has really helped you, I think. That I don't know because I don't know if it's actually working or if it's as... as, as yeah, because it's research, you don't know if you've had the real yeah. stimulation or not. But every day... Like so, every day, two, uh, two hours. So every day, which is a lot for oh, me. speech therapy. Uh, yeah, speech therapy. Sorry. Well, I'll pause it there again. You can watch the whole clip uh, that I've given you. But I think we see a few things. Uh, one is, I think her speech has improved. Um, she looks positive and happy. Um, another is... We, we learn a lot. Um, we learn how frustrating. I said it's, uh, it's very frustrating, but she thinks it's absolutely horrible. She understands it's where, you know, you can't walk. That's horrible, too. But this is the worst one. You can't communicate. You can't do Facebook texts. Um, and other things we learn. It does affect understanding, writing, not just speech. Um, you, you can't have other functions that are um, you find deficits in. She shares how it's just horrible. She walks around, she, she doesn't understand money anymore like she used to, she can't buy anything at the pub. Um, so you, you get the, the personal things, and this is why case studies are, are, are worth your, your while to pay attention to. You learn things you won't learn from from the book, basically. Let's check her out at six years. Hello, I'm Sarah Scott. Um, so new video um, because it was my stroke anniversary uh, last week um, so um, I had my stroke um, six years ago which is a long time and it seems like yesterday um, but yeah so I'm um, my age now is 20 24 um, and I'm still working at the school um, my job is um, um, science technician um, it's not full time but it's a job that I love 
gastronomy. Um, it's uh, a, a good, fun job. Um, it's just things that um, I can do. Um, it's very um, sort of practical stuff. So even though I need to talk, um, it's more things that I can do um, after my trip. So that's good. Um, so, um, and we are still doing um, our straight route. Um, and that um, it's good that it's still going. Um, but there's things that I want to do, um, some goals that I want to do as maybe still working at the school but maybe doing another job as well and we were I was thinking about doing a um a um jewelry um, making jewelry jewelry um at home and then selling it uh, online or maybe actually face to face as well I'm not sure um, what we want to do yet um, because you can do classes and things like that so maybe we might do that and um, see but that's kind of exciting um, because what I want to do is to have a house on my own um, and be independently what I would do if I didn't have my stroke and I think I can do that anyway it doesn't matter if I have a stroke it, um, I, I think I can do it um, and what sort of um, issues do you think you would have if you lived on your own because you still have there's issues still that I numbers is still difficult it's definitely better and if I do some um, not exercises but like I'm um, trying to do some numbers all the time that helps me but things like reading and writing is still difficult so if there's you know something there's a letter that I need to read if I'm on my own, it's going to be hard. Um, online, I've got some apps that help me, but it's still difficult. So it, um, that's a thing that I, it's going to be. But you can probably find ways of working around it, can't you, and get support and, and stuff like that. So Yeah, it's not yeah. like I can't do it. It's just going to be harder than, you know, another person that is not, it's not difficult to read and write, mm -hmm. I think, but that's just... Yeah. So when you had your stroke, did you think it would take six years to get this far? It's really like slow recovery from aphasia for most people, isn't it? Um, obviously I didn't know anything about stroke and aphasia, and I'm kind of glad that I didn't know, because I would be really... Uh, upset and depressed really because it's a hard thing to because your mind is the same but obviously you have problems with talking so so I was actually we were saying that um, there was a lady that had a brain hemorrhage and um, and she is very very bright but her speech is affected and she said that if you can speak very well it's kind of powering because you can say whatever you want to say and the other person will think oh my god you're really intelligent and very but if your speech is affected, people think you're not very bright or you're 
drinking or you're smoking or not drinking, <laughs> um, um, drugs. Drugs. Um, yeah, yeah, drugs. And that's not true, but it. I know what what she's saying because that's very true. And yeah. yeah. So when you didn't have much speech output, did you? Could you still? Here, or did you still know the sentences in your mind that you wanted to say and you couldn't express them? It's kind of like in your, in your brain, you, your words are the same before your throat, so you're, and the same with if you're sleeping and you've, um, like a dream, so your speech is the same, but then it's in between your, um, your mouth and your um, brain, and there's something in between that doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> and it's and it, you think, well, you understand me, but your because your speech is not perfect, that a lot of people don't understand or that they're not hearing what you're saying, and it's very hard because it, in your head you're. You know what to say, and you're very, maybe very bright. Yeah. But so, so what if somebody's watching this, and somebody that they love has just had a stroke or has aphasia? How, what? How do you think they should talk to them? Do you think they should give them extra time? And um, it's difficult because every stroke or a brain attack um, has. Every person is so different. So for me, um, if there was people that are talking to me, I can't kind of understand almost everything. But some people are, it's difficult to, if the people are talking to are uh, uh, the people that have um, strokes or whatever, they have a hard, like, so you need to slow down really. Mm -hmm. So it depends. Um, so obviously you just need to talk to the person, just say what it is it difficult to understand what I'm saying, or if it's too fast, or sometimes it's too slow and you think. Well, I'm gonna stop it there. You can watch the whole clip on your own. But again, it was very revealing. I think her speech is improving throughout the years, but it's very slow and go uh, for improvement. And um, one thing I want to point out, which she emphasized in this last clip, was your speech is the same. You still have it. You still have that uh, comprehension. You just can't get the words out. There's something, she said something, that it's in your brain, between your brain and your mouth. And that, that is these neural pathways that we're looking at. Let me advance the slide backwards. When Sarah Scott says, you know, it's in your brain, there's something between your brain and your mouth, there's these arcuate fibers that communicate from um, Wernicke's to Broca's area. And so if you can't get that information from one place to the other, it's hard to get the words out. You may understand it, but um, now that could be what's going on. I don't know, but this is the basic neural pathways that we know about. All right, so I want to move on. I know watching the case studies makes things a little bit longer in the lecture, but you can always pause and come back. And the next case, the last case, is a split brain case study. It's very interesting, and it emphasizes to students that you have two brains, left and right cerebral hem hemispheres. Those are two brains that operate as one. In the split brain case study, um, the person, Joe, had his corpus callosum severed. It helped, um, it helped deal with some seizures that he was having. Split brain studies damage severed corpus callosum. The right and left cerebral hemispheres operate independently. And um, well, let me show you how you, you might be able to see that manifest, these two brains operating independently, whereas for normal people like everyone else in the world, they operate as one. Um, 
Let's learn about the visual fields. When you see, the visual field is divided in left and right visual fields. And left, blue, right, yellow, you can kind of see that each eyeball can see both visual fields. So imagine your nose as the midpoint. And if you, for example, if I just close one eye, okay, I still see both visual fields. For example, here's the midpoint. I can still see my hand on the other side. Of course, I can see it on this side. I can still see it on that side. So each eyeball has information from both visual fields. That's the optic nerve. But look where they cross at the optic chiasm. After they cross, these are called the optic tracks. The, each optic track only has information from one visual field that goes to left brain, which sees right visual field, and vice versa. What you have to know is that the left and right brain have different functions in terms of language, like, like speaking. Language is for left brain, so they call right brain mute. It doesn't have that function. Language is for the left brain, the left cerebral hemisphere. Okay, so in a split brain study, um, what they do is you have to gaze at a central point. And then you'll, they'll flash an object in either field. And if it's flashed in the right uh, visual field, it goes right to the left brain, which can talk. And you ask the subject, what do you see? And they have no problem saying, oh, I, I see this saw. Okay, they can do it, no problem. What's interesting is, in a split brain patient, um, I'm sorry, not, not split brain, in a normal person, normal person, you flash it in the other visual field. It goes to the right brain, which can't talk, so it uses corpus callosum to get the information to the left brain, and you ask them the question, what do you see? Saw. But in a split brain, where the corpus callosum is severed, the visual information goes to the right brain, can't get the information over here. You ask them what they see, they say, I don't know, which is weird. They clearly see it. It just it can't say it, so they respond, I don't know. You don't have the language to say it. What's even more interesting, they respond verbally, I don't know, even though they saw it. They can't name it, but they can draw it with their left hand. Because remember, the right brain controls the left side of the body. And so they, they don't know what they saw, but they could draw it. It's very bizarre. And I remember reading about these in my um, physiology books. Like, for example, when I was in grad school, uh, this was the book we used. And this case study was in there. And I remember reading it, not believing it. <laughs> but now with the miracle of YouTube, you guys can actually see this case study of a split brain person, Joe. Now the left hemisphere and right hemisphere now are working independent of each other but you don't notice it now you just kind of adapt to it it doesn't you don't have any feeling any feel different than it did before seven years ago joe had brain surgery to allay the effects of severe epilepsy his surgeon cut the nerve fibers connecting his left hemisphere with his right while the operation was a complete success joe's unusual case offers an extraordinary insight into the machinery of mind this fiber system, the corpus callosum, is located midway between the two hemispheres. When it was surgically severed in Joe's brain, the transmission of information between the two hemispheres was halted. Michael Gazanik. What we can do is play tricks by putting information into his di disconnected, mute, non-talking right hemisphere and watch it produce behaviors. And out of that, we can really see that there is, in fact, uh, a reason to believe that there's all kinds of complex processes going on outside of his conscious awareness of his left half brain. Joe, I'm going to show you some things. I just want you to tell me what you see. And here we go. You ready? Look right at the dot. Okay. Right. Okay, you ready? Look right at the dot. Grapes. Good. When Joe focuses on a point, 
Everything to the right of the point goes to his left brain, the dominant hemisphere for language and speech. So we can see here that when we flash a word or a picture, Joe is easily able to name it. Close your eyes and let your left hand do a little work here. Okay, what do you got there? Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Now, when a word or a picture falls to the left of a fixation point, that information goes to his disconnected right half brain. And as we can see here, Joe is unable to name it. Joe is able to draw the picture with his left hand, the left hand getting its major control from the right half brain. Who you draw? Okay. What do you see? Wheel. On one side, and on the other side. So even though he can't name it, his left hand is able to draw out the picture of the stimulus of the picture or word that we presented to his right half brain. What did you see? So I hand it. So just close your eyes and draw with your left hand. Just let it go. It's nice, what's that? Sock. Uh, what did you see? Hammer. What'd you draw that for? I don't know. What we have with Joe is a is a, just a dramatic example of a neurologic case that really allows you this window into the non-conscious and how powerful non-conscious processes are at influencing our conscious self, our personal self. What Joe and patients like sure. him, and there are many of them, teaches us is that the mind is made up of a constellation of independent, semi-independent, uh, agents and that these agents these processes can carry on a vast number of activities outside of our conscious awareness even though that goes on there's some final stage or some final system which I happen to think is in the left hemisphere that pulls this all of this information together into a theory it has to generate a theory to explain all of this all of these independent elements and so, uh, and, and, and that theory becomes our particular theory of ourself and of the world. All right. I did skip over these. Um, name the areas of the brain for motor speech and language comprehension. Broca's area of motor speech. Wernicke's area of language comprehension. Byron's language aphasia, that was the first one we watched. That was the Wernicke's aphasia. Sarah Scott's was more um, the motor speech deficit, the Broca's aphasia, although we did learn that from watching her cases extensively, that other, other functions were wrong as well. She had difficulty with numbers. She still had difficulty reading letters by herself. Um, so these aren't completely binary. There's some bleed um, of the two aphasias. The cause of Sarah Scott's language aphasia? Stroke. She had when she was like around 18 years old. Did her condition improve? Well, what do you think? We watched the years. I would say yes. Okay. And then we had split brain Joe, and that was a very interesting case. So know those cases for your exams and quizzes. All right. Brain done.